Hello and welcome to another installment of Grasping Scripture. Glad you could join us today as we delve into 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, I know for a lot of people as they think about the book of 1 Corinthians, one of the first things that may jump to mind is the issue of spiritual gifts. And well, finally 12 chapters in, Paul starts addressing that. But he's been laying a groundwork for the attitude of the life of a believer and out of that framework he ventures into this discussion of spiritual gifts so i'm glad you're along for this discussion today and this study of god's word i welcome you if you haven't looked through the or listened through the episodes relating to the 11 chapters before this i encourage you go back get that background and framework for understanding but either way i'm glad you're joining us today as we dig into God's word and we seek to truly grasp hold of scripture. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you. We thank you for the many blessings that you give us. We thank you that you call us your own, that you have redeemed us through the the sacrifice of Christ, atoning for our sins, and that you call us together, all the redeemed, as your body, in this world, that we may live and act in such a way that glorifies you and points others to you. Father, we ask that you would continue to make clear to our hearts and our minds what it looks like to live following you. Lord, we thank you for the gifts that you give us, the greatest of which is salvation through Christ, but we thank you for your indwelling spirit in our lives as well. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Well, as we move into chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, uh, remember Paul has been responding to several questions that were brought to him in, in a letter. He's dealt with a few other issues that he was made aware of at the church as well. But here he's been trying to set the record straight or, or give a, a biblical and godly understanding of the teachings of Christ and of the behavior of the church. He's just come out of a discussion about uh, the way they were observing the Lord's Supper and how it was fracturing the fellowship, how it was not acting as one body, and how even approaching it with the attitude they were, as he began to phrase it, was um, sinning against the body of Christ. And I don't think he was referring to the the wafer there. He was referring to the church there. Um, now we move into 12, and he's, he's really carrying that thought forward. He has used it as a springboard for this next discussion. Uh, he also spoke in the last chapter about propriety and worship, uh, head coverings and, and order and things of that nature. Um, this moves forward with that as well. So let's really take a look at chapter 12 of First Corinthians. It starts out this way. It says, now, dear brothers and sisters, regarding your question about the special abilities the Spirit gives us, I don't want you to misunderstand this. You know that when you were still pagans, you were led astray and swept along in worshiping speechless idols. So I want you to know that no one speaking by the Spirit of God will curse Jesus. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So there he's laid some ground rules right up front. Is You want to know if this is someone who is worshiping God? and, you know, frankly, should be given any grounds to speak, then there are a couple of things that have to be true. One is they will not curse Jesus, because a person with the Spirit of God in their lives isn't going to do that. The second one is that they won't be able to proclaim Jesus as Lord, and that's not just say the three words. It's say them with meaning, with belief, with conviction that they will not attest that Jesus is Lord of their lives in a genuine sense, except by the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives. So if you want to know if the Spirit of God is speaking through the person that's talking or or this manifestation of a spiritual gift is from God, look at the person. Are they within the realms of 
of being one of the redeemed, of being in relationship with Christ as Savior and Lord, because if they're not, it doesn't matter how good it sounds or how good it looks, it's not genuine. And so he gives that framework before he moves forward into the rest of the discussion. Now, before we get into it too much, I'll just go ahead and do a spoiler here. Uh, part of what was going on in the church at Corinth is they had picked out certain gifts that they felt were more special than other gifts, uh, most notably the speaking in tongues and or speaking in unknown tongues or other tongues, languages. Uh, we'll get into that. But uh, that was one of the focal points for this dispute within the life of the church there in Corinth. And Paul is going to tackle that. He goes on in verse four and he says, there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same spirit is the source of all of them. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it is the same God who does the work in all of us. Now, that just seems like, you know, what, three verses there that, okay, yeah, that sounds cool. Maybe we could memorize it. Understand Paul packed an immense amount of meaning into those three verses because he says different kinds of spiritual gifts. Okay. He's acknowledging there are different kinds of gifts, but when you get right down to it, that's not the point. It's not to focus on the gifts. It's to focus on the one spirit that is the source of all of them. And there are different kinds of service. God calls us to different roles in life and different things he calls each one of us to do. But when we serve, we all serve the same Lord. And God who works in different ways, God does different things in different lives and in different places. But the God that works in different ways, but still the same God. who does the work in all of us. You also kind of have a Trinitarian expression here going on because you've got reference to the Spirit, Lord, which is reference to Christ, and God. So there's that going on in the background too. But there's a lot in those verses, but all of us draw, all of them draw us back to the same understanding. It is about God. We cannot divorce a discussion of spiritual gifts or the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer from God, because that is God. The indwelling presence of God in the life of a believer. The, as Romans 8 talks about it, the indwelling spirit of Christ, the presence of Christ in that believer's life. So you can't break that apart. It goes together. So now we'll turn our attention to the next passage. In verse 7, he says, A spiritual gift is given to each of us so that we can help each other. To one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. To another, the same Spirit gives a message of special knowledge. The same Spirit gives greater faith to another. Now, be mindful there, that's not greater faith as in greater ability to be saved through faith, or it's not saving faith. It's the faith that that gives you that special assurance and, and rootedness in God that you can face some, some special circumstances and, and have that extra boost, if you will, uh, to make it through trusting in God. So the same Spirit gives greater faith to another. And to someone else, the one spirit, or the one spirit, gives the gift of healing. He gives one person the power to perform miracles and another the ability to prophesy. He gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the spirit of God or from another spirit. Still another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages while another one is given the ability to interpret what is being said. It is the one and only Spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone 
decides which gift each person will have. Now, if you missed it there, in verses 7 through 11, the whole point is in verse 11. The whole point Paul is trying to make, the way he is trying to help the Corinthians understand what's truly important here, is in verse 11. It is the one and only Spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. In fact, they were enamored with the gift of tongues. Paul intentionally puts it at the end of the list and starts putting things like, oh, this gift of of wisdom and the gift of special knowledge and things like that he puts at the beginning of the list. Uh, He is setting it up so that the Corinthians will start to understand the priorities here and that the priority isn't what looks like a flashy or or popular or uh, seemingly more um, visible gift. Instead, it's to draw the attention where it belongs, and that's on God. That's on the Holy Spirit at work in the lives of the believers and in at work in the midst of the church empowering all of this to happen. So it's a reframing. Now, I'm going to touch briefly on each of these gifts as we go through. This, by the way, is not an exhaustive list, nor is it the only list in Scripture. There's another one over in, what, 12th chapter of Romans, and there's a few others, various places. Um, None of them are intended to be exhaustive lists of the gifts that the Spirit bestows in the lives of believer and understand spiritual gifts are not the innate talents that you have or the skills that you have worked and and developed. You know, uh, you may be gifted at, uh, I don't know, woodworking, but that doesn't mean woodworking is a spiritual gift. A spiritual gift is something that was not natural to you until you came to know Christ as savior and Lord until his spirit dwelt in you, and then he chose to bless you, to work through you, and empower you for that work. And by the way, there's a lot of uh, discussion in theological circles about, you know, whether, you know, okay, you, you were given this spiritual gift. Does that mean that's the only one you get? And does that mean that's the one you will have the whole time? Or does God gift you for the things you need for his ministry and his purposes at any given time? Do those things change? Frankly, scripture just doesn't address that. And I know there's some that read this and go, well, yeah, but spiritual gifts, that was from from that point in history, you know, the beginning of the church, and it doesn't apply anymore. And God, I, I don't really see that in scripture either. Um, God is still empowering believers for his purpose and for the building up of the church and to witness for him. Now, the gifts may look different in different places, but there are certain characteristics that Paul's laying out here that are always true and always the criteria by which we should judge, whether it's a spiritual gift or not. And to some extent, as we'll see a little bit later on, we have some control over the usage of those spiritual gifts. But remember, criteria for whether a person is being gifted by God, they cannot be gifted by God if, number one, they can curse Jesus, and number two, if they cannot express genuinely that Jesus is Lord, then, you know, right off the bat, This isn't the Spirit of God at work. It's something else. Then we look at the gifts. What are they? Well, again, that gift of wisdom. Well, the gift of wisdom is uh, not just, oh, wow, they're they're really smart and savvy. It's, It's a spiritual gift of wisdom. It is God giving that person wise words, wise words of counsel, uh, beyond the norm and empowered by his spirit, the gift of special knowledge. That's not just they're really smart. It's that they know things that God has revealed to them. Um, 
goes on the same spirit, gives greater faith. And I've talked about that. That's not just faith, faith that brings us to salvation. That is that greater faith that sustains us through those trials and through those hardships that we may face or whatever it is that that person has been gifted with that extra measure of faith to carry them through. Uh, to someone else, the spirit gives the gift of healing. Yeah. And even that it's, it's never about the healer. It's about the healer. Um, you know, too many people these days go around, they want to wave a coat around or whatever and draw the attention to themselves for healing people. Um, we don't heal. Okay. If God gives someone the spiritual gift of healing, it is that person he is choosing to work through. It is never about the person. I, I can't remember who the quotes reference to. I need to, to dig around and see if I can find it. Um, but there's a quote about the Holy Spirit, and the work of the Holy Spirit, where he's described, it may be in Gordon Fee's book, God's Empowering Presence, which, by the way, if you ever want an absolutely wonderful and difficult book to read about the workings of the Holy Spirit in the lives of a believer, particularly as found in Paul's writings, Gordon Fee is the author. The book is God's Empowering Presence. Now, it's like 1,300 pages, and there's a lot of Greek in it, but still, it is an outstanding book. In that book, I believe, is where the quote comes from. The Holy Spirit is referenced as the shy member of the Trinity. You may say, well, that's a weird way to describe, you know, part of the Trinity. But the Holy Spirit points to Christ. So the gifts of the Holy Spirit at work in the lives of a believer are not going to point at the believer. They're going to point to Christ and they're going to point to the Father because Christ points to the Father. They're going to be our light shining before men that they will see our good deeds and glorify our Father who is in heaven. That's the Holy Spirit at work in the life of a believer and in the life of the church. So if it ever becomes about drawing attention to our church, drawing attention to, to our Bible study, drawing attention to us, then you really got to say, is this the spirit at work here? But God is still in the business of healing. Going into verse 10, he says he gives one person the power to perform miracles. Yeah, God still does miracles. And in another, the ability to prophesy. Now, this is very rarely is this the foretelling of the future. This is to proclaim God's word to people. It was a, well, I know what preachers do, sort of. Um, but this is the forth telling. You've heard me say that before. The forth telling of God's word to say, here's what God says. Here's what our lives look like. They don't match up. Here's what we need to straighten out. Um, that is more the vein of prophecy here. He gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the Spirit of God or from another spirit. That's pretty important. Because there is a spirit out there that seeks to deceive. And it's not the Spirit of God. So it is important that there are people that are empowered by the Spirit of God and gifted by the Spirit of God to discern those spirits, especially in the early church, it was vitally important. And it's still pretty important that we exercise that as well. Still, another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages, while another person or another is given the ability to interpret. And those go together. Paul talks about that later. Um, you don't get one without the other. Now, um, this here, as he's talking about that in speaking unknown languages, um, I know when we're dealing with Pentecost over in the book of Acts, that is not unknown languages. That's languages that weren't known to those that were speaking, but they were definitely known by those uh, people that had come into Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles um, and were hearing the gospel in their own language being spoken by these Galilean fishermen that did not know those languages. Um, 
this speaking in unknown languages, there's debate whether this is speaking in a language that you just don't know and you need someone else to interpret that or whether um, it goes beyond that. And this is just a, a an unknown language and someone else has the gift of interpreting that language. I think this is one you got to be careful with. I can remember years ago I was uh, I was in seminary and I was watching TV. Yeah, seminarians actually do watch a little bit of TV. And on came this, um, well, he was a well-known religious figure at the time. He's no longer around, but um, he had written a book and it, was, it sounded vaguely interesting and it was free. I just had to call his 1-800 number. So I did because, you know, when you're in seminary, anytime you can get a book for free, you kind of jump at it. And as I was on the phone with the operator, before I was done, they said, well, have you received the Holy Spirit as evidenced by the speaking of tongues? And I said, well, uh, I've received the Holy Spirit when I came to know Christ as Savior and Lord, but I can't say as I've ever spoken in tongues. And so they asked me, well, would you like to receive that gift right now over the phone? And I said, no, I'm good. Thanks. Um, I've always wondered what would happen if I said yes. Because I'm pretty sure what this is talking about in Scripture is not something that an operator can give me over the phone. This is the work of God's Holy Spirit in the life of the church, for the building up of the church. And by the way, that's something that was happening at Corinth. The church was being divided by the improper use of spiritual gifts. So this whole ability of tongues, it can become a lightning rod issue. And yet here Paul is moving it to the background. And again, as we get back to verse 11, he's saying it is the one and only spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. It's not about your opinion or my opinion on the subject. This is God's business, and he takes care of it. And we need to be mindful of that. Now, starting in 12, he says, and he's shifting gears here, and he's talking about how all this fits together. He says, the human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, and some are free. But we have all been baptized into one body, by one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. So those barriers, those distinctions, those separations that we had prior to Christ don't matter anymore. They just don't matter anymore because we all stand on equal footing. Uh, the phrase I've heard before to express this is the ground at the foot of the cross is level. We all stand at the same place when we stand at the foot of the cross. Some of them were Jews. Some of them were Gentiles. Some of them were slaves. Some of them were free. Doesn't matter because they were all baptized into one body by one spirit. And they share the same spirit. He goes on in 14 to say, yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. If the foot says, I'm not a part of the body because I'm not a hand. Well, that does not make it any less a part of the body, does it? And if the ear says, I'm not part of the body because I'm not an eye. Would that make it any less a part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Or if the whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? But our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. How strange a body would be if it only had one part. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. In fact, some parts of the body that seem the weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. 
And the parts we regard as less honorable are those we clothe with the greatest care. So, we carefully protect those parts that should not be seen, while the more honorable parts do not require this special care. So, God has put our body together such that extra honor and care are given to those parts that have less dignity. This makes for harmony among the members, so that all the members care for each other. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. Now, did you catch what he's saying there? That sounds like Paul's just kind of chasing a rabbit there, if you will, uh, discussing body parts and and parts that we give special attention to and honor to or, or protection to and other parts that we don't. And what if the parts, you know, rejected each other and, and so on and so forth. But then he gets down to the, this makes for harmony among the members so that all the members care for each other. He's talking about members of the body, the physical body, because he's using that illustration. But this whole time, he's not talking about a body, flesh and blood type body. He's talking about the body of Christ. He's talking about the church. So God has put the body, the church, together such that extra honor and care are given to those parts that has that have less dignity. This makes for harmony among the members, so that all the members care for each other. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. And you may say, well, in the church I'm in, they don't care if one's suffering. No, the reality is you are a body of believers called together by Christ. And if part of the body is suffering, whether the rest of it wants to acknowledge that or not, the body suffers. If I have a failing kidney, I may not want to acknowledge that. I may not want to behave like that's the reality, But the truth is that kidney is going to affect the rest of my body, isn't it? Yeah. We're in this together. We're called by Christ. We are empowered by Christ. We are his. We are to be one. Why? Because we've all been baptized in the one body by one spirit, and we all share that same spirit. Now in 27, he says, all of you together are Christ's body and each of you is a part of it. Here are some of the parts God has appointed for the church. And again, here are some of the parts that God has appointed for the church. First, our apostles Second, are prophets. Third, are teachers. Those who do miracles. Those who have the gift of healing. Those who can help others. Those who have the gift of leadership. Those who speak in unknown languages. Are we all apostles? That is, people set apart by God for the proclaiming of his word. Are we all apostles? Are we all prophets? Those who have that that ability to foretell the word of God? Are we all teachers? Do we all have the power to do miracles? Do we all have the gift of healing? Do we all have the ability to speak in unknown languages? Do we all have the ability to interpret unknown languages? Now, he's asking all those questions, and they're they're rhetorical because he gives the answer very clearly, and in the text I'm reading with an exclamation point, you know, the, the emphasis there. Do we all have these things? He says in the end of verse 30, of course not. 
Again, how weird a body would look if it were all one organ. But instead it's made up of many parts. So in verse 31, so you should earnestly desire the most helpful gifts. Who? The most helpful gifts? That's an interesting way to phrase it, isn't it? And yet it speaks to the purpose of the gifts. The gifts are for the building up of the body and for the advancement of the kingdom. They're not for personal gain or personal notoriety or any of that. Remember, the Holy Spirit points to Christ who points to the Father. So is that where our lives point? Is that where the living out of our faith points? If we claim we have a spiritual gift, are we using it in a way that is in line with what God has said? And are we participating as part of the body that we were placed into by his will? And as he sees fit for his purposes, the church at Corinth wasn't doing that. And so Paul's trying to help them understand this framework, but I think it's probably a framework that most churches need to understand. And again, I'm not getting into a debate about, you know, spiritual gifts and whether they're valid today and da, 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 da. We have the spirit of God living in us. Scripture's pretty clear, I believe, that when we come to know Christ as Savior and Lord, he gifts us with the indwelling presence of his spirit. And that spirit is at work in our lives. And we see that that spirit bears fruit in our lives. He also calls us to purposes and empowers us for those purposes, those roles, those parts in the life of the church. Now you may be saying, but but Scott, there's, there's stuff I do in the church and I don't see any spiritual power behind it. I don't see that I'm gifted for that at all. Well, maybe you're doing the wrong thing. You know, maybe you're not where you need to be. Sometimes it's not about how you feel. Listen to the people around you. Is God using you in that position? But also it may be that you're just doing the wrong thing. Maybe you're filling a hole because someone asked you to, or you you saw there was a vacancy there and you decided, well, somebody needs to do it. So you stepped in to do it. You realize you might actually be in the way of the person that God did gift for that spot. Uh, We've got to be sensitive to this. We've got to be discerning. We've got to pay attention. And we've got to seek to be a part of the body, not the one that gets all the attention. Because the one that gets all the attention should be Christ. So again, do we all have any of these gifts? You know, any particular gift? No, of course not. But verse 31, so you should earnestly desire the most helpful gifts. Yeah, the ones that advance the kingdom, the ones that build up the body. Desire the most helpful gifts. Now, God assigns the gifts as he sees fit. That's his decision. But desire the ones that are most helpful. The Corinthians were desiring the ones that were most uh, visible. Paul says, desire the ones that are most helpful. He goes on to say, but now, so he's shifting gears, but now let me show you a way of life that is best of all. So he's like, I've, I've set the framework and I've given you the, this advice and I've said, you know, desire what's most helpful. Now I'm going to show you a way of life that is best of all, not just, oh, it's a good way or it's something that, no, this is the way that is best. And then it stops. That's the end of chapter 12. He leaves you hanging for chapter 13, which if you've ever been to a Christian wedding, you've probably heard. But we'll get to chapter 13 in our next installment. And we're going to approach it from the framework of chapter 12 because we put the chapter breaks in. Paul didn't. It's part of the same discussion about spiritual gifts and being one body with one spirit and about desiring the most helpful gifts in a way for our lives that is best of all. 
And so we'll dig into that as we get into 13. Now, as we finish out 12, something to consider. What's been our motivation? What's been your motivation? I have to ask myself, what's been my motivation? What are the things I pursue in the body of Christ and long for in the body of Christ? Is it about his spirit? Is it about his kingdom? Is it about glorifying the name of Christ? Or is it about glorifying the name of Scott? Or insert your name there. He called us out of what we were and into something so much more in him. Let's be one body seeking to live for him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your indwelling presence in our lives, that you do not leave us to to figure it out and just stumble through following you on our own, but you call us to follow you and you empower us. You give us the voice of your spirit in our lives, guiding us so that we may be more effective in glorifying you and living in obedience to you. Father, I pray that you would continue to give us a heart for you and a longing to live for you. And that that will show itself in how we live alongside other believers as part of your body. Lord, I thank you for that gift of salvation in Christ Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen.